As great of a medium video games can be, I feel that some people don't fully understand why they're such a great art form. There's this perception among fans and developers that there's only one way for video games to be artistic, how they should have stories that can only be told by video games, whether that would be through gameplay or how the player is supposed to feel as they play the game. This is a shame, because I feel like video games are some of the most versatile art forms ever made. Though it's great when normal gameplay is used as the main control of the narrative, I don't see an issue with video games borrowing storytelling techniques from movies, books, or even music. That being said, I believe that, above all else, no matter how you want to tell your story, a video game's characters are the most important part of the game and its messages. It can be easy to overlook how characters can define an individual video game, especially given how most modern AAA video game characters are looking less and less iconic. In the past, I have talked about how companies like Nintendo have a knack for fleshing out their characters so effortlessly through gameplay and simple character design. But I did also mention that other games develop their characters in a more traditional sense by writing immersive conversations that bond them all together. The year 2017 gave us two games that have this technique written in their game like a rose tattoo. Those being Atlas's Persona 5 and Bandai Namco's Tales of Berseria. Given a couple of my previous videos on Persona 5, I feel like my opinion on the game has not been made very clear to some people. If you want my roughly full opinion on the game, I'll link my review on GG App in the description below. But the short version is that I think Persona 5 is an amazing game, but it is far from a masterpiece, let alone Game of the Year material. As clever as its themes and ideas are, I do feel like it's missing one of the key ingredients that can turn a good story into a great one, and that's subtlety. There are so many moments where the characters just spout out the themes of a palace or explain to the player what's going on, and it always takes me out of the story. In contrast, Tales of Berseria pretty much is a masterpiece and should have been nominated for at least the best JRPG of 2017. Like, come on, Jeff, you had no excuse. It's not perfect either. No, 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 no. But I'd argue that its subtlety is one of its greatest attributes. And it brings the game's world and characters to life without constantly clamoring about everything that's happening. It's also why I think Tales of Berseria is objectively better than Persona 5. And if for some reason that triggers you, then you can platonically suck my nuts. Some might say that subtlety in video games isn't always necessary, as there's often no room for it. And normally, I'd agree with that. But not only is Persona 5's story not one of those games where subtlety should be disregarded, but with games like these, there is a topic to consider. Implicit and explicit exposition. Whether you've never heard of this topic before or need a refresher, implicit exposition is when exposition is being implied. It's usually in small doses, like through dialogue or characterization. This is how Tales of Berseria likes to tell most of its story. Meanwhile, explicit exposition is when the exposition is explicitly being explained to you. Sometimes it's used naturally, like through narration or story synopsis. This is how Persona 5 usually tells its story. Implicit exposition is highly preferred in writing, even in video games, but that doesn't mean that explicit exposition is bad. It's used in a slew of other works, usually during an antagonist introduction of a movie. But even then, you can't just rely on saying that the villain is powerful and expect everyone to believe you. The villain has to bust enough bolts so that he's better than a rhino. Plus, there are certain specific situations where explicit exposition just does not work, such as bonding characters. I think it's safe to surmise that both of these games are character-driven narratives. Which means that they have plenty of scenes where the characters connect with one another by standing around, talking, standing in another location to talk some more, opening a door and taking time to talk about it, walking along water and taking time to talk about it. And I decided to analyze two of these scenes that bond characters fairly early on in the game, which in my opinion is where the game should start doing so. I'll begin with why Persona 5's use of explicit exposition is not ideal for bonding your characters. The first scene that I will be looking at is Persona 5's Hot Pot Celebration scene. This scene takes place shortly after Madarame's palace has been cleared and the best asexual and a romantic boy, thank you for reminding me, good sir, formally joins the Phantom Thieves. Yusuke requests to know the rest of the party better. 
and then decides to fall asleep as she's not gonna have any conversation with this sexual predator. But to be fair, I don't think she really needs to join this conversation. At this point in the game, we know everything we need to know about Yusuke and Anne since the first two palaces fleshed them out, but there isn't too much known about Ryuji, so he's the first to speak about his past. He brings up how his dad left him at a young age and how his life has been living with a single mom. He then elaborates on his situation with Kamoshida and brings up how his mom stayed silent in the face of constant antagonizing. After Ryuji's done talking, the characters finally get to learn about Akira's past, which gets the party angry for his sake, especially Ryuji. So far, this is good! This is really good! Ba da ba ba ba! I'm loving this! It's a good use of explicit exposition because 1. We get to know more about Ryuji's backstory. 2. The rest of the characters have never learned how Akira got a criminal record in the first place. And 3. Neither did the player. The beginning of the game did mention it, but it never went over the full details, so the player finally gets to listen to that story here. With all of this, the characters are bonded by their troubling experiences with adults, their opening up supports the game's themes of camaraderie and corruption in a natural way, and their reactions and responses further motivate the characters to continue stealing the hearts of corrupted adults. But unfortunately, much like the exaggerated mess of a mediocre game reviewing company, let's be honest here, all of this is ruined by one single line. It almost feels like I've known you all forever. Do you think it's because our backgrounds are so similar? Okay, and Little Miss Not-So-Sweetie, I've seen you driving around town with a man I l like enough to dedicate a video about him, but I'm like, F*** you! And f*** him too! This is the equivalent of that one scene in Interstellar where Anne Hathaway says that infamous line that basically says, Hey guys, the theme of this movie is love! You guys, did you know that we have themes? Are you impressed by our themes? And, um, and... Okay, okay. This is the part of the video where I need to be citing the Closer Looks video on how to write great dialogue, as I should do so before this video turns into plagiarism. One concept that the Closer Look brings up is subtext, which is sort of like a hidden meaning behind a line of dialogue. Having seen his video, I feel that his main argument about subtext is that it can either make a line of dialogue amazing or pointless. And if a line of dialogue has no purpose, then it's guaranteed to be bad dialogue. With this in mind, what is the purpose of Anne's line right here? Well, it's exactly what she says. The characters in the game are bonding because of their similar backgrounds. But the thing is that this idea was already being conveyed through normal conversation and some observational dialogue from Yusuke. So Anne's line right here is an example of pointless dialogue and more egregiously, useless subtext. This isn't even the only bad line to come out of Anne's basic white trash mouth. She has a handful of other lines that are just as bad, and even worse. But f**k this line in particular, as this was the moment where I was convinced that Persona 5 was not worthy of a Game of the Year nomination. Not because of the line itself, but where the game seemed to be headed with this line. And you will probably never hear me say this ever again, but I hate that I was correct. As Persona 5 got even more on the nose as I played the game. There are a few lines from the other characters in this scene that may come across as on the nose, but I can defend most of them. The Closer Look did say that great dialogue is more nuanced than the purpose it serves. Yusuke is being observant and curious about his new friends. Ryuji's outburst clouds the consequences of the conundrum that come with taking down the mighty men in the mirror of society. Okay, I gotta admit, that Michael Jackson reference was insanely forced and, dare I say, truly cringeworthy. But they could have used a mirror for later on in the game because that outburst likely foreshadows their rapid ascension in reception and recognition, which causes the Phantom Thieves to worry about what happens when they get outed for tackling these bigger targets, and to consider what is going on when that actually does happen. And Morgana's line is... another incorrect use of subtext, but Morgana is one of the worst characters in all of fiction, so it checks out. Anne's line, however, doesn't quite make sense for the character. If the game is going to rely on explicit exposition, fine. If the game is going to disregard subtlety and be smug about it, fine. If the game is going to be as annoying as a YouTuber constantly begging for subscribers because he barely has over 350 subscribers and really needs more because he puts a lot of work into his videos, fine. 
But the words being stated should at least be something that I would expect the character to say. I guess it's not as out of character for Anne as I used to think it was since she is able to feel emotions from the paintings at Madarami's art show, and she does try to see the best in people. But I think you could slap this terrible line on any of the characters in this scene and have nothing change. Or maybe even be better. Yusuke could say this line as a means of expressing satisfaction for getting to know the party better. Ryuji's dim wit and seemingly dearth soft spots would be pushed aside for another moment of vulnerability. Even Morgana could say this in an attempt to grow with the party members in a way that actually sells me on his friendship with anyone aside from Ryuji and Anne. But even with all of this context in mind, there are much more creative ways to establish camaraderie than a shitty line like this. Going back to Anne, wouldn't it make more sense for her to help alleviate the pain that Ryuji, Akira, and Morgana have been feeling instead of pretty much telling the player what the scene is about? There's this saying from movie reviewers on YouTube that watch too many animated movies to a point where I feel like they started living in one, but it's that kids are smarter than you think. Well, this is an M-rated game, so adults are smarter than you think. Except when they're not, but I think even a caveman could feel the empathy being delivered by these voice actors and the connections made by the dialogue. And I don't buy that this dialogue is realistic. When people are having conversations like this, their response is focused on the person's testimony. No one in the history of ever has said, It almost feels like I've known you all forever. That's not how anything works. I do have a pitch for rewriting this moment in the scene. It would start the same, having Anne wake up from her nap, mentioning that she had been up for a while, and then Ryuji asks if she heard everything that they were saying, which Anne would say that she did and give some helpful insight on Ryuji's backstory. She could say that he's still growing as a person contrary to his past struggles and failures, and despite his mother's silence, she was being the bigger person in the situation. Maybe she could also talk about some instances where she did still notice his strong points in middle school. No need to be specific, but something about how she regrets being silent herself in that situation despite wanting to stand up for Ryuji and his mom would be enough. The game did want to build a close relationship between the two, even though it wasn't the best at demonstrating enough points. But either way, why not build on that here? She could also admire Akira for showing vulnerability given that he always had to act headstrong and stone cold for so long despite all the gossip about him. Maybe she could also comfort Morgana on how his lack of memories don't have to define him. Ryuji would be moved by Anne's kind words, and then hide his surprise behind a jest, as he does, and Anne would respond with, I don't know, I just felt like saying something. My Anne impression is a real 10 out of 10, don't at me. This last line would better support her renowned kindness and ability to sense the emotions of others, while still keeping the scene's idea of bonding with the rest of the cast and the game's use of explicit exposition. Obviously, you could change or even shorten my choice of words for the characters so that it conveys all this information in a short time frame, especially since, at minimum, this series of conversations is around 7 minutes. So, I don't think that snipping out a minute or two of this scene would hurt it that much. Although, Tales of Berseria has a scene that does everything Persona 5 tried to do here, but within a shorter amount of time, and with vastly better execution. <laughs> Tales of Berseria has a lot of really good dialogue scenes and ambitious themes, but I have a video in the works that goes into more detail on that, and much more, so subscribe to my channel and stay tuned. This scene takes place shortly after the rest of the party members hear the main villain's speech about how he intends to rid the world of sin. The party spends the night at a tavern being run by a shadow guild where they have been given some assignments that they need to complete before receiving more information on the villain, his posse, and their plans. However, two characters, Rokuro and Aizen, stay up and have a drink before resting. Something vital to understand about these characters is that they have a solid grasp of their philosophies. Rokuro is a demon samurai who manages to keep his previous morals intact and even maintain some surprisingly strong sense of honor. As for Aizen, his life as the first mate of Eifried's pirates has helped him develop his own beliefs. He even had this brief monologue where he expresses how much he despises people who try to control the direction of his life. It kinda comes out of nowhere, but it does teach us more about Aizen. His wheel is his to control, yet ironically, in the same scene, he's controlling the direction of this pathetic little knight. Sometimes you have to make compromises to stay true to your philosophies. 
Now, onto the scene where they drink the night away until you all vomit on the floor. Tonight you'll spit vomit on the This video, because my singing fing sucks. The scene begins with Aizen asking the woman running the Shadow Guild about Eifried's whereabouts, who sadly doesn't have a clue. He then finds Rokuro chilling by himself, enjoying a drink. Notice the immediate subtleties by Rokuro offering him a drink of his sake and Aizen lifting his hand. He'd rather drink his liquor. They then talk about why they're choosing to work alongside Velvet. This is noticeable because Rokuro comes from a background based on tradition, while Aizen lives his life by his personal experiences. Yet, for some reason, they're taking orders from this young woman who seemingly has no remorse for her actions, fewer combat skills than a samurai, and less life experience than a pirate who has sailed the seas for a thousand years. Rokuro says that, for him, it's about repaying his debt after Velvet found his blade. The player already knew this, but as this scene reveals, there's more to it than that. Being a demon samurai with a sense of honor and morality, there's nothing reasonable about its existence, and, well, I'll just let these next few words speak for themselves. And in this brave new world governed by reason, a rogue can either rage and become a monster like me, or, or band together with others. Like a ship full of pirates, perhaps. At first I thought that this line right here was on the nose, but then you go back to where they said this. A demon repaying a debt? Ridiculous. As ridiculous as a pirate Moloch, you think? Hmm. This is how the scene uses implicit exposition because Aizen is starting to get an understanding of Rokuro's philosophies and finding a common ground. Despite their different backgrounds, they're not different people. It even explains why Velvet recruits characters like Dial and why the rest of the party continues to bring along other faces like Kurogane and Rainbow Mika Child. For Rokuro, it's not just about repaying his debt. It's that he met someone with a common goal in mind that he never had the chance to act upon himself. Though Rokuro is a man that aspires to grow stronger and defeat his brother once and for all, he never had the strength he needs to do so. But he sees that kind of strength in Velvet, and this type of strength is foreshadowed as an imperative theme in his character arc. This is one of the better aspects of the game's characters. They're not going on this quest because the game tells them to, it's because they want to, which, yes, Persona 5 also does pretty well. But these guys have their own selfish but noble goals that happen to be aligned with other characters, and scenes like this go over those very motivations. Of course, we still need to consider what Aizen is getting out of this conversation. He gets this feeling that he's known him all forever. Shut the f up, idiot! Aizen is impressed by how Rokuro managed to man the wheel of his own ship. It is a part of his foolish creed folly, but he does appreciate Rokuro for sticking to his own beliefs. Because as it turns out, Aizen is following Velvet for his own goals as well. Or in his words, to see how deep her foolishness goes. This ties into the game's idea of going against what is considered good because even if you have modest intentions, going against the ultimate authority is foolish regardless of whether this authority is right or wrong. That said, it takes real strength and courage to rebel against it at all. Fools this strong aren't born every day, but as Obi-Wan once put it, who's the more foolish, the fool or the fool who follows him? Or her in this case, because... Velvet is just Ragna with a super crown. There is one more moment that ties the scene all together. Remember how Aizen initially refused Rokuro's drink? Well, by the end of this scene, Aizen pours one last drink of his liquor and gives it to Rokuro, who then gives Aizen the rest of his sake. Although I'm pretty sure Rokuro finished his sake because of how that part was animated, but... Let the game be subtle, it's beautiful! The best part about this is that they do not call attention to it at all. I have seen a couple of people mention how an exchange of drinks was a sign of brotherhood in Japanese culture, and while that does make sense in this context, I think that it's mostly a reference to the fact that Rokuro loves a good drink. But maybe this scene is a reason why. You've seen older men chilling out maxing and relaxing while having a conversation over a beer or something, and that's what this scene is conveying. It also tells us more about Aizen that despite his rough and gruff exterior, he's pretty down to earth. Notice his choice of words, his tone, and his body language. I could ask you why you've tied yourself up with Velvet. If it was rephrased to something like, well, why are you tying yourself with Velvet? It may come across as confrontational, depending on the delivery. But this phrasing is meant to convey how Aizen is open to an understanding for Rokuro. 
His body language in this scene is also noticeable because he's initially positioned in a way where he's trying to give advice, but isn't fully invested in what Rokuro has to say. But as the conversation continues, Aizen veers his body so that it's pointing towards Rokuro, eventually sharing drinks with him because these two fly their full flag proudly. Oh, but that's not even the end of the scene, f*** all, as we get one last shot of Makilu looking out into the distance where she says this. It almost feels like I've known you all- Of course she does not say this, you moping mongrel. Even though it's essentially one of those, it merely amused me moments, it does give her a reason to tag along with the group. It's not as good of a scene as the one with Rokuro and Aizen, but it's not meant to be. Its main goal is to explain where Magilu is and why she sticks with Velvet before she can even serve a use to her. Not to mention that she's always intentionally vague with who she is for most of the game, and this is a rare moment where she isn't, at least to the player, as they can understand what she's currently up to. Do you see why subtlety is so important for moments like this? <laughs> As mentioned before, explicit exposition isn't inherently a bad storytelling technique. Sometimes it's necessary to give context for a setting, character, world, or whatever. And to be fair, implicit exposition is difficult to utilize as subtlety can be tricky, but explicit exposition is harder to cleverly weave in. And when it comes to bonding and connecting your characters, it's better to be implicit. Persona 5 is an example of what can happen when you're not subtle. It has a slew of dialogue scenes, the majority of which are good, but other times it feels like I'm in the middle of a tedious class discussion instead of a moment where the characters are supposed to develop. And that's why I decided to focus on the subtlety instead of the overall content of the scenes. When a writer throws subtlety out the window, I can't get engrossed in conversations like this because I get treated like a dump And then these characters feel more like tools instead of, well, you know, characters. I understand that they're often used that way, but they can be both? This is why I love Tales of Berseria so much that I consider it a better game than Persona 5. Berseria's characters don't need to explain how they feel in a situation, and even when they do, it never feels artificial as it's at a key moment in a scene or development. Plus the dialogue is infinitely more creative than anything in the Star Wars sequel trilogy cause... I'm done poking facetious slander at Persona 5 for today. Despite my criticisms towards Persona 5 and its writing, I don't want to come across as condescending to the developers or the writers for one bad scene. Or even for multiple bad scenes. I mean, who do you think I am? Seavit? No. Because the Seavit that I know is not the same Seavit who made that Persona 5 style over substance video. On top of that, the topic of this video is about the styles of delivering exposition, how they can be utilized, what happens when you mess them up, and how it can be done better. Keep in mind that writing is excruciatingly difficult, especially for video games that usually have multiple writers working on it. Heck, this video was a challenge for me to make. Almost as much as my video on Tales of Berseria, which, if you thought that some of my previous videos were long, just take a look at how many pages I have for the script of that video so far. And this is single-spaced. Wanna see what it looks like when it's double-spaced? Not much, but... Why not subscribe to my channel and check out my other videos while you wait for it?